we'll uh, as uh, we'll get ready. I know that we are, we'll probably have more people coming in and uh, parking and, uh, and meeting everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. <clears throat> um, I was telling uh, all the participants today that we'll wait for maybe uh, maybe a couple more seconds for other people to come in. And uh, we have a uh, an interesting uh, session today. But just as a recap, we had Fawn Pochel, the uh, the last session. She's a representative of the American Indian Center. And uh, she enlightened us with uh, um, her, uh, her experience and her knowledge and gave us a very insightful uh, land acknowledgement. I wish I could replicate that today, but uh, she'll, uh, she'll be back with us on the next session as well to finish with uh, her uh, topic on the hand drums as well and all the meaning behind it. She also showed us a painting by a Native American that took a bunch of different meanings depending on the music that she was playing for us. And today we'll do a lot more things with uh, music. Hello, I see Deborah. Hello, Deborah, Don, Jaws. Hello, Jaws, Bessie, and Judith, Anne, and uh, Sujang, and PV. Welcome, everybody. And Colleen, Colleen, hello. All right. So looking at the clock, hopefully we have more participants. Hello, Jazz. And uh, today we might not uh, uh, listen to the river as much, but instead we are going to be talking about the qualities of sound and how they might relate to music but also we'll be touching on uh, your perception of sounds and your perception of what can be music and what might not be music. So we are gonna take a trip into different uh, soundscapes, into different uh, um, uh, situations, different ways of looking at sound. We're gonna talk about a couple of composers and we are gonna encourage you to participate today as well. But before that, we are gonna do a couple of introductions. First of all, thank you so much to the Friends of the Chicago River and uh, to the Bridge House Museum. Thank you, Josh, for joining us and uh, giving us this uh, amazing opportunity to, uh, to work with you. And uh, thank you to the American Indian Center here in Chicago. And thank you to Fawn Pochel for participating. And we can just get started. And uh, I wanted to introduce you guys to uh, Parker Nelson, who is our uh, French horn player. And uh, he has a couple of treats for us. Yeah, for sure. So today in the spirit of exploring some new sounds and how those sounds relate to our environment, um, luckily my instrument is extremely good at that. So. Those of you who have maybe never seen um, a horn before, it's this very pretty looking one. Um, the big circle with all the fun stuff in the middle. Um, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but um, it's a really interesting thing to be able to talk about connections to our environment when it comes to music making, because that was is what this instrument is all about. So um, when my instrument kind of first started, um, you know, it's called the horn because a lot of people were using animal horns um, and, you know, hollowing them out and buzzing through them uh, to make those kinds of sounds. And it was really more of a tool than a musical instrument in that it was a communica communicative device um, to kind of over long distances be able to amplify a signal um, to other people. And so animal horns were used, but then also you see a lot of things like this. Um, so conch shell, if anyone is familiar with this. And I actually, I didn't find the shell, but I did turn it into a musical instrument um, by just sawing the tip off and essentially kind of making a space where I can buzz my lips um, into this. And that's kind of how these instruments all work the same. So I just get to use them in different ways. So um, hopefully this isn't terribly loud, but um, we'll give this a go. So 
there's only a limited number of notes that I can play, but there's a lot of fun different sounds that that I can make by using things that you find um, in nature, the way that they're, you know, that nature has kind of designed them. Um, yeah, a real horn call, that's for sure. Thanks, Sixto. Um, and, you know, things like that have evolved into um, instruments that are maybe a little bit more familiar, like the alp horn, which you can see is on my wall back here. It's very long. It's 12 feet long, um, one straight tube, which is essentially what the French horn is, except for it's curled up and it has some additions to it. So um, this instrument is made out of brass. It's typically kind of um, introduced in the brass family along with the trumpet, the trombone, and the tuba, um, just based on the material that it's made out of. But essentially, this is a 12-foot long thing, if not more, um, that's kind of wrapped into a place where I can hold it and manipulate it. And the only real difference between the thing that you see on the wall and this and this um, is that these buttons right here kind of allow me to change the length of tube that I'm accessing at any time. And because of that, I can play a whole bunch of different notes. So just like I have a very limited amount of notes that I can play on this, um, I'm essentially doing the, the mechanics are the same and that the vibration, the sound that's being produced is coming from me buzzing my lips, um, but I'm just changing which notes I have access to by essentially making the instrument longer or shorter. So um, here is a really quick piece that I'll play for you um, by Rossini. And it is essentially just a grand fanfare that was kind of composed for um, like hunting parties that were going out. And this would have been played um, on an instrument that's much older than this one. Um, but I'll give you a little sample of um, Rendezvous de Chess by Rossini. So just a little sample of the French horn for you all um, today, but we'll get into some more um, in interesting ways to make sound um, with our environments around us in just a little bit. Very cool. Thank you for all of that, Parker. Um, it's a really nice how you put it on now, so I can relate the shell with the alpine horn all together. And now I look at them in a different way. That was super sweet. Thank you. And um, my name is uh, Sixto Franco, and I uh, have here the uh, the viola. Some of you already have heard it um, uh, if you joined us in the previous sessions. So uh, just following the what Parker set up, the, um, the viola belongs to the family of the strings, and uh, it has evolved a lot through history as well. Some of you might, might be familiar with the um, with the viols or the viola da gamba. And uh, it has taken a bunch of different shapes and ways of playing as well. The, uh, viol the cello, for example, comes from the viola da gamba setup that uh, uh, the instrument lays on your uh, legs and, and you play that way. That way, and the viola da gamba also evolved to be uh, the, uh, the double bass that we have today as well. Eventually, those instruments um, became a little smaller and they uh, were able to be played uh, resting on your chest, very low on your chest or on your shoulder as, as well. And eventually those, um, and, uh, sorry, transform themselves into the violin and the viola. But uh, uh, doing a little exercise of uh, imagination, if you start 
changing in your brain this instrument to a bunch of different shapes and sizes, you might, you might come across a lot of the instruments that a history has seen that has four instruments, uh, four strings, two strings, six in strings, 15 strings, a bunch of them in uh, the same instrument. So this is uh, the viola and uh, it's just a little lower than the violin. And uh, I've been playing it for, uh, for a number of years. And uh, as soon as I, I went to the conservatory, somebody told me, well, well, you want to actually play the viola? And I didn't know what it was. I have no idea, even though my father was a musician. For some reason, the viola didn't even get the, uh, in, in to be acknowledged in that way. But um, uh, I, I fell in love with it. And I wanted to, uh, to improvise a little bit of music for you guys and give you a little bit of a... Uh, a prompt now to actually start warming up on um, on our par participatory sense for today. So just take a minute to, to think or to let some thoughts run through your brain as you listen to the, to the, to the music. And if you don't mind using the chat to actually uh, uh, write some of the thoughts or some of the uh, uh, imaginary that you might see by listening to, the, to the, this instrument. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Feel free to type uh, all the sensations that you felt in the chat. I feel warm and rich like chocolate. That's probably the best compliment I ever got. Chocolate fountain, <laughs> resonant, thank you. And some, uh, somewhat uh, mournful. Yeah, that was a, a fully improvised and I'm not sure uh, what sometimes it's gonna come out, but I develop an, an idea and yes, it was a little bit more emotive. Thank you, Don. Very nice. So um, just uh, housekeeping things, we want to include uh, every, um, every single session a land acknowledgement. And uh, this is something that we are learning more and more of working with the American Indian Center and working with community building uh, organization as well. And it's important to uh, to acknowledge that part of history that uh, it's, it has been uh, uh, deleted, erased, or, or annihilated in more, more of the cases. Um, and we want to emphasize and amplify the, um, the efforts that have been made, uh, are being made right now to actually consider, to think about it, to recognize where we have been. So um, let me take uh, just a little second. And uh, Parker, feel free to, to post it if you, if you want. It is vital to recognize that this country was founded on genocide and the removal of its first peoples. So by doing land acknowledgements, we are starting to recognize a more truthful history of this country. We are providing healing to the land by speaking to it and saying the names of its caretakers or indigenous peoples. In Chicago, where we uh, where we are right now, right now, and we encourage you, if you are not in Chicago, to uh, to uh, search who lived there before before you. Uh, in Chicago, we are occupy occupying the traditional homelands of the Odawa, Ojibwe, and uh, Potawatomi people. And Illinois is also the home of the Ho Chunk, Miami, Inoka, Menominee, the Sac, and Fox people. Many of us arrived in this country in quest of a better life and uh, many around us came as enslaved people. It is important to acknowledge that the past is complicated and it require, requires reflection and a dismantling of systems of oppression. And it is equally important to acknowledge that native people are not people of the past. 
there are over 70, there are over 75,000 tribal members in Illinois, many living in Chicago. So this acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Since our activities are also shared digitally to the internet, we can also consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structure, and ways of thinking we use every day. And we are using equipment and high speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. And these technologies we use in art making contributes to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. We can acknowledge all of this as well as our shared responsibility and to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation and decolonization and all of our work together. So that's part of the reason why we wanted to do this workshop on the sounds of the Chicago River and how we relate to them, how uh, the river and its um, landscape plays a, a, a part in uh, our sounding environment. And what are we doing with it if we are living in the city? How much do we get from it? How much we actually cancel? And uh, we wanted to point out that like a community efforts, a togetherness on doing this. That's why we are using deep listening, which is um, a practice that actually brings awareness to all the sounds that are around you in a way that it's um, wholesome. We are trying to make our body uh, listen as well, not only with our ears, but also with our body and also listen to the sounds on uh, imagination and dreams as well. And we feel like it's a very important step to learn how to listen. If we want to um, listen to history, listen to the things around us, listen to the possible change or imagine the possible change that we have in our hands these days. With that said, togetherness, we want to do things with you. And at this point, I would encourage or I would love for everybody to turn on their cameras because we have a couple of uh, body movements that are, uh, we, we love, they are a lot of fun and uh, it requires kind of like the communication. So for now we can actually keep our microphones off but please join us um, by um, turning your cameras on. And uh, if you are able Hello, everybody. If you are able, I would love to for you to uh, to stand up from your chair. If not, we can uh, we can also do it from uh, from uh, where you're sitting as well. And well, today is Thursday, so we had a few days already probably sitting at the screen and uh, spending a lot of time uh, sitting. Right? Hello, everybody, and good to see everybody. So take advantage of these uh, couple seconds to shake it, to actually ask yourself, "How am I feeling physically?" and shake it up, blow up a little bit, kind of let your body do what it needs to do. <clears throat> Oh, and get ready to actually start feeling a little more, get your uh, blood flowing. And now just find a comfortable position standing and take a second to reflect on yourself. And uh, I'm gonna ask you this, what is it one thing that you like about yourself? What is it one trend of your personality? that you like, that you feel comfortable uh, letting it out, that you feel comfortable uh, sharing. And this is just uh, for, uh, for you to think. <clears throat> Take a second on that. What, what is a trait of uh, yourself or your personality that you like? And um, just, a, just as a help for me, um, since uh, we've been in, in, uh, in this uh, pandemic year and uh, how our work has changed a lot, I feel that I, I found myself being a little more um, brave and courageous to actually take new things like, uh, for example, improvising as a classical music that might be 
sometimes not uh, in reach. Uh, so uh, let's say, yeah, courageous, for example, or that specific type of courage. Oh, courage, sorry. So now that you have that, I wanted you to create a short movement that might represent what that uh, characteristic of yours is. So uh, just an example for courageous, I would do something like something open that opens, but that will be just for me. So take a minute to actually find a movement that might represent that trait of you that you really like. Something that I forgot to mention, we really love the uh, phrase lift of judgment in deep listening. So we can allow ourselves to uh, kind of do things that maybe are not as common as we uh, do in uh, everyday life, right? And now that you have your movement, make it in a way that uh, it can be looped, it can be repeated. I love that, Parker. And investigate on the space that Zoom, this, this space that Zoom gives us and how we can actually manage this box. And for now, just focus on, uh, on yourself and that movement. You kind of find like a comf comfortness by repeating it. And now that we looped our own movement, I wanted you to look around to somebody that might be doing a movement that it might be intriguing to you. And when you're ready, add it to your dance as well. You start with your movement and then you add one more that you see. Kind of make it a little dance. And as you have one and two movements, look for a third one and add it to your collection as well. And now it's not only your movement, it's a little bit like three people collaboration here. For Pete that just joined us, Pete, we are doing an exercise where we are moving and creating movements that people can actually join us. Hello. So good to see you, Pete. All right. Uh, slowly come back to a steadiness and take a second to reflect on how that felt. I could, I could see, I could see like it, it takes a little bit to warm up, right? And uh, that is one of the keys of deep listening as well. It, it plays around with uh, vulnerability. And uh, we um, understand that some of the exercises, because they are new, in my, in my tag into that. And, but once we do them, it feels, it feels, it feels good to us. So uh, I wanted to open up the, the room briefly. How did it feel for you guys? I see Pete just joined up, was ready to do this. Hand thumbs up. And for all of you, hello, for all of you that are participating, if you wanna share your, your thoughts, what you saw, how, you, how did you feel? I can start in that I love this exercise um, only because even just the way that it started by, you know, trying to associate some sort of movement with um, 
with the way that we feel about ourselves is so unique. But I love kind of like getting to see what people do. Um, and every time we do it, it's different because of the different group of people. And I just like love watching the creativity of the folks that we've got in the room with us today. It was super fun. Thank you, Parker. And I have a question right now. Maybe uh, we don't have to answer it right now, but in your brain, was this a performance? And I'm gonna leave it there because we're gonna touch on, uh, on more on that question a little later. Yeah, and so with this deep listening practice that we're um, all kind of experiencing maybe for the first time, um, we kind of touched on the movement modality, maybe a little bit of the dreaming modality. And just to go over um, those three, so we have movement, sounding and listening, and dreaming. So those three things kind of make up this practice that we're exploring in our um, music making today. And so you might be saying like, why movement? Why is movement part of a musical practice? Um, and we like to say that like listening to your body, listening to your thoughts and dreams and being able to replicate those through a movement is something that is very much musical, um, even though you might not consider moving your body around as sound making um, in the traditional sense. Uh, it's something that we really enjoy doing. And like Sixto said, um, a lot of this can be really difficult to do. And it's not that the movements themselves are difficult, but putting yourself out there into a space with a whole bunch of strangers can certainly be difficult. And when we were first kind of starting this practice, I came up with um, an exercise, or we like to call them text scores, because they're not, it's not music that is notated with notes on a staff with a key signature and all these other musical things that we're used to, but rather it's kind of like a short paragraph that elicits um, responses from people to collectively make music together. Mm -hmm. So I came up with this because um, I was really sick of being on Zoom all the time. And that was literally a year ago. So here we are um, <laughs> still on Zoom, but um, the piece is called Zoom Fatigue. And before we start, um, the way that this works is that everyone um, will have their cameras on, or sorry, cameras off and microphones on. Oh, hello, we have a new a new member joining us. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, so go ahead and turn your cameras off and turn your microphones on. And this piece goes like this. Create the sound you want to make. Move your body in the way you want. You are not on camera, be yourself. I'll read it one more time and then we'll go through a short performance of it. Create the sound you want to make. Move your body in the way you want. You are not on camera. Be yourself. Whenever you're ready. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
All right, that seems like a good place to to wrap it up. So you can either keep your microphones on or off, but go ahead and turn your cameras back on and join us back in our Zoom space. So I'm curious, um, what was that like? What did people think about performing that piece together? And feel free to either just hop off mute and you can just talk, or if you wanna put your responses into the chat, that's fine as well. Julie said it sounded like my kindergarten classes. Yeah, that's such a good observation. So we we use this metaphor, all the metaphor, I don't even know if that's that's correct, but we use this this mindset all the time when we talk about this kind of sound making. And you know, even for people who have made their living as musicians, as people who are making sound, um, this gets difficult for Sixto and I and everyone else in Fifth House Ensemble. And yet we always kind of draw our inspiration from children because especially at a young age, like kids are unafraid to make sounds. They are unafraid to express themselves. And kind of over time, we learn this behavior that we don't necessarily want to be just making sounds and expressing ourselves whenever we want to. And it becomes more and more difficult to do so. And we love watching kids perform stuff like this because they just totally go ham where it's like, wait, you mean I can actually do this? Blah, 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 and they go insane, um, which is fabulous. And um, so I, I love that you're drawing that comparison because that's something that we really strive for as far as our inspiration for how to express our feelings in a moment in an artistic way. Kids are the best at it. They're also, when I when I say unafraid, and you know, think about uh, a child who's learning to walk for the very first time and they fall down and maybe they cry a little bit, but it's they don't ever just be like, that's it, I'm never walking again, right? They just get back up and they try it again. And yeah, kids are the best at this kind of stuff. So Jess says it was interesting, almost felt like there was a rhythm to it somehow. Um, interesting, can you, can you tell us maybe a little bit more about how that sounded to you? Yeah, it was kind of interesting. I walked into the other room briefly to kind of hear it from the other side of the apartment. And it almost felt like there was like, like common sounds that happened over and over again, but I couldn't quite mm -hmm. understand what they were when I was outside of the, um, directly in front of my laptop. So it was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I, I think that that's great. You almost kind of get this sense of like conversing between people, even through sounds, even though you don't know who it is. Um, but like hearing a sound and responding to it where you're like, hmm, I like that. Um, yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. And um, Colleen talking about background noise. Yes, for this activity, we love all of the background noise. So I'm so glad, um, you know, the yapping dogs, whatever it is. Um, it's super fun to just kind of like let it go and see what happens. I appreciate that, but he was really obnoxious. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting with, with deep listening practice and kind of being in this mindset 
um, I think we've all probably seen or heard the trope of like going to a concert and somebody's cell phone goes off, which for a lot of classical musicians, it's like, hey, I'm working here. Bruh. And um, after I started working with this more, I played a concert and we were doing a Beethoven symphony and um, somebody's cell phone went off. And I thought to myself, like, instead of like, wow, what an annoying thing that this is happening more along the lines of like, wow, what an interesting scenario that now is maybe the only time that this particular sounds is like those sounds are going to meld together and that we're experiencing them, but also that it's such a interesting um, like kind of marker of our time where those two things are coming into contact with one another where it's like, yes, Beethoven didn't have cell phones when he wrote symphonies. Who knows if he did, maybe there would be cell phone parts in the music, who knows? Um, but having those things meld together um, is really fascinating to me. And of course there's like, you know, there's a time and a place and we all, you know, when it comes to classical music, there's a certain ritual to it that um, can be really enjoyable, but uh, taking it as an artistic experience um, on its own is has been a really unique change in my in my personal perspective when it comes to this. So, thank you everyone for uh, participating and kind of getting our sound making going. We're going to be doing a little bit more of that in just a minute, um, but I will hand it back over to Sixto, who can uh, tell us a little bit about what we're going to do next. Thank you so much. I loved how the conversation started. Taught, uh tapping into the elements of music basically, but everything lays on the how you actually conceptualize these uh, sounds and uh, what you can do with them and what they mean to you. And that's where we are gonna discover a little bit more from the point of view of a composer, for example, but also without forgetting that the audience might have a say in on this as well. So starting from uh, uh, Josh Cole's comment about the rhythm, even though every single sound that we made was uh, out of uh, freedom, out of in, uh, our individual uh, perception, it kind of put itself into the, this mix uh, that had almost like a, a, a different concept on its own or a different life. And Jaws was able to pick up on, on it, like it had a rhythm. And uh, even though it was organic, it was still there. And that is some, sometimes what the composers might be looking for, how, can I put myself in a position where I'm outside and taking all the sounds possible? And what can I get from there that uh, might be musical? Or in other words, can we make all the sounds musical? Would that be an option? So we're going to discover a few different ways of thinking about this. But first, I wanted to introduce you to a composer named uh, Sammy Sussman, a very young um, uh, composer who came to our Fresh Ink Festival, which is a festival that we do up in Kenosha for two weeks every, every summer. But now these days is virtual. And we meet up with uh, a lot of composers. We premiere uh, 24 pieces and we work those pieces with um, uh, young musicians and put them together and perform them. And the piece that occupies today, today occupies us today is called Irie. And uh, what you're gonna hear, it's basically the sounds from his backyard. And I want you to pay attention to these sounds and how he treats them and makes them into something else? Question mark. Thank you. 
Thank you, Parker. Thank you. Yeah, what a beautiful piece. Um, I wanted to open up uh, to all of you guys. What do you hear? What do you, just to start with, what do you hear? So um, over at my apartment, it was kind of uh, serendipitous in a sense because on the other side of my laptop is a window and um, about halfway through two uh, cardinals came and are in the tree across and it all was almost as if they were performing along with it. It was very pretty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Pretty uh, organic, right? It kind mm -hmm. of both worlds matched. Exactly. I see uh, Chica B, Chica, sorry, Chica D songs from uh, Colleen. That's impressive. I'm gonna uh, switch the, co the question to, uh, what about the instruments? What do you hear the instruments doing? And feel free to unmute yourself as well. I think I see Pete typing, echoing one another, repeating notes. Mm -hmm. Imitation, right? Sorry, Anna, I'm not sure if you were to try to say something, but you you were on mute. Embellishment. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, echoing one another, repeating notes, repeating what we were hearing. That was uh, Sammy Susan's approach. He, uh, there were no, sorry, from Pete, there were no ugly noises, purposefully. The musicians were careful to create something beautiful. Thank you, Pete. Let me tell you a couple of things about the piece. The piece, as I said, uh, it draws from imitation, but also all the gestures, uh, he described them as uh, uh, we, we, we were able to play them freely, only listening to the soundtrack, which was his backyard. And that will inform us how to actually place these, uh, these sounds. He barely, barely modified anything that he was hearing. And I thought that was very interesting. He create, he kind of added to the environment, but only using the material that he heard, only using the natural timbers of the of the instruments. But he didn't kind of develop the the piece as well. So he was imitating also. So I'm gonna go back to my question: Was this a performance, and why? How would this be different from what we did on movement or what we did with Zoom fatigue? And we don't have to answer it, but if you want to answer it, please go ahead. I'm just looking at the time because we are gonna keep touching on this a little bit. If it's a performance, why? If he, the other one, if our, our movement little piece was a performance, why? And that kind of takes me to who can perform? Yeah, so, We've talked a lot about, you know, realizing that there might be like a technical, per, like a technical side of performance or an artistic interpretation of a work that somebody wrote, like what we just heard. Uh, but it can also be an action that's kind of taken by a group of people. And so what we want to do now is a piece called Environmental Dialogue. And again, if you feel free or if you feel comfortable, um, participating and sounding with us, that would be great. So what we're going to listen to is a recording of the Amazon rainforest. It's an on-site recording that a friend of ours made. Um, and I want you to just kind of find a comfortable position that allows you to make sounds comfortably <laughs> and just kind of bring yourself in a place where you're able to listen, but then also sound. So some of the things about, um, you know, um, echoing and, you know, providing other sounds that all that stuff's going to come into play here as we listen to this. So we're going to take a few moments to listen um, to the sounds as if they are music and use your ears as microphones. So you might 
think that you hear everything that there is to hear. And when you get to that point, I want you to listen even deeper and listen without judgment and try to find every little thing and that all sounds are going to be musical. And when the time feels right, feel free to unmute and make those sounds and reinforce the sounds either with your voice or mentally. Um, we're gonna reinforce those sounds and try to make our own little rainforest in this Zoom space here. And there might also be um, some other surprises that come out of this as well. But let's get started with our rainforest sounds. Here we go.
Thank you, everybody. That took us basically to the end of today. And uh, that was a piece by our own Dan, Dan Visconti called uh, Low Country Haze. And as you could uh, already um, tell, it came out of nowhere, basically. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. It's such a beautiful piece, such a fulfilling piece and um, spiritual. And uh, it gives me chills all, all the time. Yeah, so well, so well written. So the inspiration was a, um, a quiet moment that he had and he was uh, uh, listening to. But there's a story about the um, um, some of the first uh, um, Sparker review. Yeah, the first yeah, settlers that... to come to North America and their experience kind of traversing the landscape for the first time. But um, in you know, in the spirit of what we talked about today, it's the smallest ideas and they're all around us. And it's our ability to be able to listen and to be able to amplify the things that we experience um, in the world that surround us that are really the most beautiful and can evolve into some really amazing things. So um, yeah, uh, we wanted to leave you with that today out of some sounding that we did of our own because uh, the piece really was you know, designed to start that way. Um, but I know that we're, we're a minute over time. Um, so I know that there may be some, some questions, but I'll put um, both Sixto and my email address into the chat. Um, if there's more information that you want to find out either about upcoming sessions with um, Friends of the Chicago River, Bridge House, uh, American Indian Center, Fifth House Ensemble, what have you, um, stuff we did today, we'd be more than happy to, to connect as much as possible. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, and continue the conversation. Thank you so much. And to uh, Deborah's uh, uh, question about performance, I think our goal was actually to challenge what the concept of performance was. And uh, so uh, we don't have an answer. It's, uh, I think it's up to us to find an answer on how we deal with sound and how we can transform it and what we can do with it. It's not necessarily only appropriation for composers and, uh, and artists or people that have managed sounds, but it can be up to us to actually interact in a different way. So thank you so much, everybody. That was a beautiful session. Thank you for participating. And uh, we'll see you in the next session as well. And just a reminder, there's a, fin there's a final performance on May 30th at the Bridge House Museum and uh, open in the open doors. So uh, we hope to meet you there and you'll hear this piece again among others. Thank you.